Good morning and good afternoon and good evening to everybody. Welcome to Book Club with Jeffrey Sachs. I'm Jeffrey Sachs, university professor at Columbia University and president of the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network. And I'm absolutely thrilled with the conversation ahead with Martin Sherwin. We'll turn to Martin and listen to his wisdom in just a moment. Let me say a word about the book club. We'll be speaking this year with the world leading thinkers and especially world leading historians uh, about our world, about where we have come from to arrive at where we are today and where we need to go. It is a, uh, a famous aphorism, of course, of uh, George Santayana uh, that those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. What we learn from great historians, though, is uh, not uh, the difficulty of remembering the past, but of uh, knowing it in the first place. <laughs> because what uh, Marty Sherwin's uh, fantastic book and the other great books that we're going to be discussing this year show is that we've never really understood our own past, even the most critical uh, moments uh, of our past. And when we do understand them more clearly, they bring into focus incredibly uh, our challenges and our difficulties of uh, keeping a balance uh, in this world and finding a way forward. I could not be more excited to start the book club with uh, Professor Martin Sherwin, who is a university professor at George Mason University uh, Professor Emeritus of Tufts University and the world's leading historian of the Cold War and the nuclear arms race and the topic of today's book at uh, the center, uh, the greatest crisis of the nuclear age, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, we're discussing uh, Marty's new book, Gambling with Armageddon. Uh, it's a fantastic book. Book. It's a thrilling read, Marty. Uh, it uh, you, you just uh, it's gripping in every page and startling in the details, uh, with the, the, your mind exploding uh, each each moment. My God, could this be real? Uh, so I I want us to discuss that and uh, to share that feeling with the, all of the people listening. But if I may, I want to start with a quotation of John F. Kennedy a year before the Cuban Missile Crisis. It's uh, in your book. Uh, it's in his speech to the UN General Assembly in 1961. He says, quote, every man, woman and child lives under a nuclear sword of Damocles hanging by the slenderest of threads capable of being cut at any moment by accident or miscalculation, or by madness. And what strikes me about that quotation is, first of all, Kennedy got it. Uh, he knew how extraordinarily dangerous the world was, how survival was hanging by a thread. He said it, he knew it, he felt it. And yet he walked right into the nearest disaster that humanity has ever experienced. And that is a profound mystery because this was not an impetuous person, an irrational leader. We know some of those. This was a, a person who understood and intuited, as he said in his inaugural address, for the world is very different now. Uh, we have hold in our hands the power to destroy all life. So he was completely sensitive to this. And yet it almost happened. And as your book describes, it almost happened beyond his control, though he was president of the United States. So can we open with that? <laughs> because that is the big theme of your book. And it's stunning. Well, thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. And I appreciate um your enthusiastic embrace of gambling with Armageddon. Um, and I really appreciate your beginning with that uh, quotation uh, because uh, Khrushchev, who didn't speak in such elegant 
language uh, would have said the same thing in one way or another. And uh, you're absolutely right about Kennedy having this understanding of the danger of nuclear weapons and the threat to humanity that they posed. Uh, Khrushchev shared that. Nevertheless, and this is the key, nevertheless, understanding those, those dangers completely, they both embrace nuclear weapons as an instrument of diplomacy to advance their, um, their agendas. Uh, and that goes way back to uh, the beginning of the nuclear age. And that's why um, I, although I started to write a book about the Cuban Missile Crisis, which is generally understood to be the 13 days in October from October 16th to October uh, 29th, uh, and sometimes defined uh, as starting with the Castro's revolution, uh, I realized that the nuclear temptation is embedded in uh, the whole history of uh, uh, the nuclear arms race, beginning with Hiroshima. Marty, it, 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 uh, it, it, it's so, so poignant. And uh, one uh, remark of Khrushchev completely uh, points this out also. Uh, I may get it a little bit wrong, but at one point when Khrushchev first proposes uh, in uh, either late 61 or early 62 to put the missiles into Cuba, I don't know, I don't remember whether it was Gromyko or who it was said to him, but that's war. And he said, of course we don't want war. Uh, so he, he made the action of putting the missiles in, not to go to war, not even to risk wars, the farthest thing from his mind, <laughs> which is an incredible thing. It was done, as you say, diplomatically, but craziness, but it was done. Yes, yes, and it's still being done. I mean, why do we have 6,000 or so nuclear weapons today on uh, alert status? Uh, it's absolutely crazy. Uh, I mean, think, well, we can think about it later when we get, you know, to the present. But uh, with Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the idea that this fantastically powerful weapon could be used to advance the uh, agendas, uh, first of the United States, then of the Soviet Union, uh, then of Britain, and you know, and so on and so forth, uh, uh, became a temptation that uh, the leaders of the United States and the Soviet Union simply could not resist. And um, uh, this is the framework uh, that uh, is that we constructed uh, that will eventually uh, lead to our doom if we don't do something uh, very radical about our uh, nuclear uh, uh, hang-up, I guess you'd call it, or addiction is a better word. Yeah. I, nuclear this, addiction. It is an excellent word. And, and actually, if we could go back, uh, we'll get to the Cuban Missile Crisis uh, uh, shortly, but... Uh, I do want to go back to the start and also to mention, uh, of course, you are the Pulitzer Prize winning co-author of a, a related fantastic book that should be read together with the uh, gambling with Armageddon. And that is American Prometheus uh, about uh, J. Robert Oppenheimer, the American physicist who leads the development of the atomic weapons. And uh, in that book, uh, you start at the at the very start uh, when the idea of a nuclear weapon is uh, at at the beginning, and uh, the physicists are right to Franklin Roosevelt that uh, America should have it before uh, uh, Germany gets it. Uh, the project is started with uh, Oppenheimer's uh, scientific direction, uh, and then I want to bring you uh, start our discussion uh, about that uh, to. Uh, Germany's defeat 
uh, in May 1945. Uh, and the weapon is not yet final. Uh, and some of the scientists are saying, OK, Germany is no longer a threat. Let's stop before we actually even finish the atomic weapon. At that moment, Oppenheimer says, no, 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 we've been hired to do our job. Let's finish. Could you just pick up the story at that point? Because that is the start of the, the, the atomic uh, age. Uh, right. Um, the, the, there's a wonderful interview in a film called <clears throat> The Day After Trinity, uh, Robert Oppenheimer and the Atomic Bomb. Uh, documentary film, uh, an interview with uh, Robert Oppenheimer's brother, Frank Oppenheimer, who was also a physicist and was also at Los Alamos in the last year or so of, uh, of the war. Uh, and he's asked why uh, the project continued, why he, Frank, uh, continued, who was a very uh, progressive, uh, progressive fellow. And he thinks about it for a few seconds, and he says, uh, the science got a hold of us, or words to, that, words to that effect. They had started something, and they had to finish it. Uh, now, that was definitely one reason. Uh, another reason was uh, Oppenheimer's idea that this incredible weapon was going to change how the world interacted, how nations uh, behaved with each other. The threat of destroying humanity, he believed, would be so overwhelmingly obvious and so clearly requiring an international arrangement that made sure that nuclear weapons did not uh, uh, proliferate, uh, that it was important to demonstrate the, uh, the power of this thing. So nations would say, oh my God, uh, we need to get together. We need to change the way we think. Uh, and this, that was... This this did not prove to be very accurate. No, no, it was incredibly naive. Uh, but when you, you know, list all of the, um, uh, the reasons for that thinking, you know, there were good re you know, there, there's no, there's no in, you know, nuclear, uh, uh, uh lobby. Uh, it's, it's all brand new. It's going to be delivered to the world suddenly. I mean, how, how can sensible leaders not uh, join together to avoid a nuclear arms race that can destroy the world? Exactly. Well, the answer to that is our history, unfortunately. Well, you, you've written that history and uh, you've written about, uh, and uh, actually I'd say you're the leading historian of why uh, the bomb was used initially after Germany's defeat and then uh, Japan on the verge of surrender, Truman goes ahead and uses uh, the nuclear bomb, not even uh, just once, but twice uh, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, we could spend hours on this and I would love to, yes. but uh, <laughs> could we spend just a couple of minutes about that decision? It was, it's depressing reading, frankly, uh, but I wonder if you could uh, help us to understand. And uh, for me, reading about Truman in, in both the Oppenheimer book and in Gambling with Armageddon was really depressing because uh, I had liked Truman, <laughs> but uh, not, not, uh, not so much, I would say, at this moment. So uh, may maybe you could describe the, uh, the, the decision. Well, you know, Truman was in a... Um... Uh, uh, an, an awful box. Uh, he was uh, dropped into that box, suddenly totally ignorant. Uh, he had been vice president for, I think it was 82 days. Uh, he had met with 
Roosevelt only once say he didn't know anything about the atomic bomb. He didn't know anything about foreign policy in general. Um, and uh, he brought in an advisor, uh, James Burns. Uh, and to make a very long story short, Burns was a real hawk. And Burns's view, which we have documented uh, again in interviews that are available uh, on tape, uh, was uh, it was my belief, Burns, and I'm quoting Burns, that we should uh, end the war as before the Russians came in. And Burns promoted the idea of using uh, nuclear weapons. And Truman went along with that. Uh, and we had two different kinds of bombs, vanilla and chocolate, uh, a, um, uh, uh, a gun type bomb of uh, uranium uh, and the plutonium uh, bomb uh, that was used on Nagasaki. And both bombs, both bombs were used. Um, the important thing for the Cuban Missile Crisis and for the story that I, I'm trying to explain is that uh, that weapon, uh, that use, the use of that weapon had a profound impact on Stalin. Uh, David Holloway, um, a wonderful historian of uh, Soviet nuclear um, uh, uh, culture and politics and uh, diplomacy, uh, wrote a book, Stalin and the Bomb. And it's quite clear in that book that uh, Stalin saw Hiroshima and Nagasaki as events that were designed to frighten him. And not, he, not, not all wrong. Yes, not all wrong. And uh, he uh, immediately said, we just have to have a nuclear weapon. So Oppenheimer's idea that by using nuclear weapons, we would uh, alert the world to this terrible threat uh, had exactly the opposite effect. Uh, and you take it from there. And to try to sum up uh, a, a lot of what happened, uh, I think after uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, the nuclear weapons played a role, a significant role in American foreign policy during the Truman administration. But it was a backdrop role. Truman always believed that he needed to have nuclear weapons because the Soviets were going to have nuclear weapons and we needed to have better ones and more of them, but we keep them in the background. They're in the bullpen, so to speak. Eisenhower comes into office. But before we get to Eisenhower, can I ask you about one thing that I've always uh, wondered sure. about, which is uh, NSC 68, yes. the National Security Doctrine written by Paul Nitze, I believe, in uh, 1950, which is an incredibly hawkish statement where America foreign policy becomes based on the idea that the Soviet Union is going to take over the world unless the U.S. stops it. Uh, it seems a self-propelling part of this story, but becomes the core of U.S. foreign policy. I wonder if you could explain the mindset a little bit. Uh, and Nitsi continues in this leadership role also for Kennedy as well, of course. Yes. So um, the uh, uh, essentially the Cold War is evolving from 1946 uh, through 1949, 50, and, and so on. Uh, what happens in 1949? 1949 is a critical year. The Chinese communists take over China in the summer of 1949. What else happens in 1949? The Soviets explode their first nuclear weapon August 29th, 1949, uh, the United States picks up um, uh, evidence of this and uh, panic sets in. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Nitsi, who has been a hawk for the last few years, becomes takes over from George Kennan as head of the policy planning staff of the State Department and uh, writes NSC, you know, 68. And um, uh, he argues, in effect, that the United States needs to, uh, I think it's more or less quadruple its size of its forces and rely on nuclear weapons. Uh, Truman just looks at the price tag for this and says, interesting, and puts it on the shelf. But what happens a few months later in June 1950? The North Koreans attack South Korea. NSC 68 comes off the shelf okay. and becomes uh, a foundational document, as you said, uh, for the structure of the Cold War that will follow. But so there let's let, let's go to Eisenhower, who becomes uh, president on uh, uh, early 1953, uh, I guess uh, January 20th, uh, 1953. Uh, he is a balanced, level-headed, shrewd, capable bureaucratic manager, uh, and yet uh, ends up dramatically accelerating the nuclear arms race, which uh, one wouldn't necessarily have guessed ex ante that Eisenhower would do because he seems actually the, the uh, consummate rational manager uh, in a way uh, based on the World War II experience. But he becomes the agent of another acceleration of the nuclear arms race. Why? Yes, uh, yes. Well, uh, I think the first thing you, we have to say um, what we have to emphasize, because you said it, is that based on World War II experience, Dwight Eisenhower spent his entire life before the presidency in the military. Uh, he led the victory in Europe. Uh, he, in the summer of 1945, uh, was against using the atomic bomb. Uh, he said that to Truman and possibly, uh, I mean, he said that to Stimson, the uh, Secretary of Defense uh, at the Potsdam Conference, and he may have said it to the president also. Uh, but in 1953, he comes into office and for all the reasons that you described in terms of his personality, said, what am I facing? I have the Korean War. I have uh, uh, to deal with the Soviet Union. And the one thing we didn't know about Eisenhower is what an anti-communist ideologue he was. Mm. I mean, and I, I quoted in somewhere in Gambling that in 1946, he wrote in his diary, we are in something to the effect, we are engaged in a race to the death with, you know, with communism and uh, 1946, I'm, you know, in his diary, you know, uh, a race to the death. I mean, we've just been allies for the last, uh, you know, five, four years, five years. Uh, so Eisenhower looks around and, well, we have superiority in nuclear weapons. The nuclear temptation is there. Mm -hmm. uh, Eisenhower turns to the nuclear weapon and he says, we are going to develop a policy of massive retaliation, uh, brinksmanship, and all of those things that got blamed on Dulles. But in fact, Dulles was the mouthpiece. He was almost a puppet, you know, for, for Eisenhower, who was the puppet master behind uh, uh, this foreign policy that moved nuclear weapons from the background from the bullpen to the foreground. And when Eisenhower came into office, there were about 1,200 nuclear weapons in the American arsenal. When he left office, there were over 22,000 oh nuclear weapons in the American arsenal. Uh, the Cold War and the nuclear arms race, as we know it, 
was structured by the Eisenhower ad ad administration. And it became a blueprint for Khrushchev. One of the things that is also puzzling for me, uh, Stalin dies in 1953. Khrushchev gives the famous uh, speech to the 20th Party Congress. Uh, as you point out, uh, I think it's Dulles who dismisses this historic moment as saying, well, that's the rantings of a, uh, of a drunkard. Uh, but, Al Alan Dulles, Alan. Oh, Al Dulles. Alan Dulles says that. Okay, the brother, uh, the uh, head of, was he, was he deputy head of the CIA at that point no, or head of the CIA? Head, head of the CIA. Head I. So here, Stalin's dead and there's clearly outreach from the Soviet Union to do something different. In, including the, the agreement in Austria in 1954 to withdraw from Austria. So how much more clear could it be? Even Eisenhower makes some initial peace gesture, but it ends up, it ends up not having the effect. Why? Well, you know, uh, that's a $64,000 question. Uh, 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 not just for that moment in history, but for so many moments in history where that sort of um, inability for two sides who want something uh, cannot figure out how to get it uh, because they're afraid if side A makes an offer that looks soft, Side B will say A is softening so we can be tougher. And that's what's going on with the United States and the Soviet Union through most of the uh, Cold War, but certainly in the 1950s, where ignorance was the foundation of policy. Ignorance was the foundation of US-Soviet relations during the 50s. Mm -hmm. uh, Khrushchev was terrified that the Americans were going to attack the Soviet Union. The Americans were beating the drums that the Soviet Union was going to take over Europe and attack the United States. Uh, and it was, it was just, you know, a, a, a flailing in the dark, even though both nations, or the leaders of both nations at least, were uh, seeking some kind of stability, both arrangements in Europe and certainly with respect to the nuclear uh, to nuclear weapons. But the more they worried about it, the more they got deeper into uh, the nuclear soup. So to speak, and and isn't it the case also that uh, you know when each side says the other wants the worst, part of the problem is that there are some on each side that do want the worst. Yes, and and on the U.S. side, uh, the idea of a first strike against the Soviet Union wasn't a fantasy only of the Soviet Union. That's right. It was a fantasy of, of some U.S. of Curtis LeMay maybe or others. Yes, yes. Uh, Curtis LeMay became head of the Strategic Air Command after um, he uh, was very successful in Europe during the Berlin Air Airlift, 1948. And during the 1950s, uh, he developed this most extraordinarily efficient and dangerous, uh, you know, service. Uh, so the Strategic Air Command uh, was, uh, you know, the nightmare of uh, Khrushchev's uh, every, uh, every thought about the United States. And these um, ideas of striking the Soviet Union uh, in order to uh, have, prevent a war, you know, start a war <laughs> to prevent a war. Uh, you know, they were all over the newspapers. I remember when I was in, uh, I was the air intelligence officer in my squadron uh, from 1961 to uh, 
through the Cuban Missile Crisis. And uh, I remember reading uh, all of these confidential uh, uh, articles that would be sent to people like me, you know, about the likelihood that we are going to have uh, a war with the Soviet Union. It was more than likelihood. It was, you know, I remember one article that just talked about the inevitability uh, of it. Uh, so, you know. The, the, the mindset is incredible. And that brings us, let's, let's uh, jump up to uh, the, the uh, immediate antecedents uh, of, of the crisis, uh, how we got to October, 1962. But I, and I'd like to start with uh, John F. Kennedy, who's a, a great hero of mine, and I've uh, I love loved so many things that he did. But but he definitely played a role in stumbling into this crisis in in several ways. One of which is during the 1960 campaign, he ran to the right of the right. It seems calling a uh, claiming a missile gap with the. Soviet Union that Eisenhower had been soft uh, on weaponry and so forth. So he set himself up as uh, I'm really going to take charge of uh, an aggressive nuclear uh, arsenal. Uh, that's correct. Uh, he ran to the right of Nixon. Um, he uh, uh, criticized the Eisenhower administration for uh, allowing Castro to stay in power. Uh, and he uh, talked about a missile gap. Uh, turned out there was a missile gap, but it was the other way around. The yeah. United States was way ahead of the Soviet Union. And um, uh, he, as you said, boxed himself in completely. One of the most interesting stories, uh, part of the story of the Cuban Missile Crisis, is the relationship to the Bay of Pigs. Uh, the Eisenhower administration uh, had secretly begun training anti-Castro Cubans to invade Cuba, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, to invade Cuba. Um, uh, and this was handed off to uh, the Kennedy. And uh, Kennedy looked at this and he said, oh my God, this is, um, uh, this looks, this looks stupid, you know, basically. <laughs> but how can I not, do what I said Eisenhower should do when Eisenhower was getting ready to do it. Uh, you know, I'm stuck. Yeah, he had and, boxed himself into the corner. So, totally. And, and then uh, presided over this disaster. And yes. one of the things that always struck me of the uh, utter disaster of the Bay of Pigs uh, was uh, partly the context that... Uh, a few months uh, earlier, before Kennedy became president, uh, the U-2 spy plane of Gary Powers had been shot down uh, over the Soviet Union. Uh, Eisenhower said it, it was a, uh, a weather uh, reconnaissance uh, uh, ship, thinking that no way uh, had the plane or the pilots survived. So Eisenhower blatantly uh, lied, I mean, vulgarly lied, and then they produced Gary Powers alive, the pilot, and the plane wreckage uh, and said, you've lied everything. And then what's, what struck me about the Cuban Missile Crisis, in addition to how stupid the idea of this invasion of, uh, uh, of Cuba was, uh, when it happened, Kast uh, Khrushchev sent a letter to Kennedy, uh, of course, saying uh, there are pirates uh, in your government that are launching this illegal operation. And uh, Kennedy writes back, we have nothing to do with this. You know, this is completely hands off. And Khrushchev writes back to Kennedy saying, don't ever lie to me this way again, basically paraphrasing. But it strikes me that American presidents lied so vulgarly twice to Khrushchev in a matter of months. This was our diplomacy. <laughs> Say anything. And the other side knew and so it must have been even more of the uh, uh, of the salt in the wound uh, for Khrushchev that <laughs> I can't even deal with these people uh, between these two events. I don't know if does that resonate uh, what I'm saying uh, because it always struck me 
the, the it is a big problem of international affairs in general, but the amount of lying is so pervasive, we lose track of how to reach agreements because of that. Uh, that's, uh, that's true. Um, and one of the ironies of that is, <clears throat> is that uh, uh, Kennedy was uh, hoping from the time he got into office to uh, uh, create a relationship with Khrushchev that was reliable. And in order to do that, instead of handling everything through the normal channels, uh, he set up back channels, uh, uh, back channel correspondence. Uh, he had his brother Bobby, um, uh, deal with a Soviet a GRU agent, um, uh, Bolshakov, uh, and he thought he was getting the uh, the straight skinny, so to speak. <laughs> you know, the back channel is the honest channel. The public channel, we have to say what we have to say. Well, Khrushchev took advantage of this and, um, and then lied, you know, to Kennedy. Uh, and when he decided to put uh, the missiles into Cuba, which was about uh, the spring of 1962, uh, uh, he just kept saying, these are defensive weapons. Well, you know, he had a point that we had said that all of the missiles that Eisenhower had sent to Europe the Jupiters that were in Turkey, the Jupiters that were in Italy, the Thors that were in Britain, all of those were for defense. Mm -hmm. Those, uh, we, we, we're not going to start a war. We're just, those missiles are there to prevent the Soviets from starting a war. Well, Chris just said, well, that's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm putting the same kind of missiles in Cuba in order to prevent the United States from invading my new best friend's territory. Um, and, uh, and also, uh, it'll help balance the, you know, the nuclear arms race. And uh, it's, it's striking in, in, uh, in the book uh, how little Kennedy was really even aware of the Jupiter missiles. Uh, he needed to be briefed on them. He didn't really know why are they there? <laughs> what are they doing? How many? It, some, something so salient in the adversary's mind was yes. not even very conscious in his mind, even though it was at the complete center of these issues. You know, that is a very good point that you make. The imbalance between how one side views a particular issue and the other side views it so differently. Um, uh, that's true of Berlin too, uh, which becomes central to uh, the Cuban missile, the Cuban missile crisis. And uh, the point that you make about uh, Kennedy not understanding uh, or not really being on top of uh, the Jupiters uh, comes out of the secret recordings of the uh, 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 XCOM meetings. Uh, XCOM was the executive committee of the National Security Council uh, that um, uh, were the advisors that Kennedy brought together after he was told about uh, the discovery of the Soviet missiles in Cuba on October 16th. Um, uh, it is fantastic to watch Kennedy's mind, the way he thinks about things that are, it's so different from the rest of his advisors. And this is an absolutely unique, you know, document. We have secret recordings uh, of the most uh, dangerous crisis in human history. Uh, and we know exactly what these guys were all saying. Yeah, and uh, this, this for all of the people listening, you've got to read this book to see the, both the drama, uh, the, uh, the shape of the conversations, uh, the 
<laughs> incredible luck that we got out of this uh, in one piece, but it's uh, such a power of your book, Marty. And another uh, uh, incredible uh, power of the book, because you go hour by hour, literally, during this period, is not only what happens in XCOM in this uh, executive committee of the National Security Council, but then how the discussions there are reinterpreted in the Defense Department, in the State Department. Everybody freelances. Uh, and when somebody doesn't hear what they want to hear, they go back and they tell their colleagues something different from what was just agreed, typically to the chiefs of staff who just can't, they just want to know the moment that they're going to be let loose to start the war. Uh, and LeMay, you know, it should have been, uh, of course, 10 years ago for him that uh, we, we do this attack. But the way that they report these meetings back to their colleagues, also I found completely stunning how hard it is to keep an administration, you know, to keep a group together on a common theme, of course, under pressure with so much complexity. But uh, maybe you could reflect on that. Well, you know, it was one of the uh, real surprises for me. Uh, I, I had the transcripts uh, and the, the recordings uh, of the XCOM meetings, the meetings of Kennedy's advisors. And very briefly, uh, it, it included uh, Bobby Kennedy, Robert McNamara, Secretary of Defense, Dean Russ, Secretary of State, uh, George Ball, Under Secretary of State, um, uh, and, and so on and so forth, um, about 16, uh, 16 people. So you have 16 people sitting around a table talking for three hours, two, three hours. There's a lot going on. I mean, and um, uh, General uh, Maxwell Taylor, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, is a member of the XCOM too. And then I discovered that we had some remnants of um, uh, the meetings of the uh, Joint Chiefs, and uh, m much of these uh, these minutes uh, contained what Maxwell Taylor reported went on in the meeting. Now, most of the time he, you know, he got it right. But what was really interesting was how many times he would report something that was actually different that was said on the tape. Now, I never thought for a moment, and there was no indication, that he distorted anything purposefully. It's just that you're sitting in a meeting for three hours and you're taking some notes and you have a point of view and you're contributing your point of view and, and you're, going, you're going back to your colleagues uh, uh, you know, an hour later and you say, well, here's a quick summary and here are the important points as I see it. Well, what you see is you know, what is most in your mind. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, you, you remember best what you believe. Right. <laughs> and, and sometimes what you believe is what the others believe too. But there are times when it's the opposite. It's also fascinating, by the way, uh, the <laughs> microphone kicks up side conversations, uh, kind of uh, parting remarks. And so there are so many dynamics going on in the room over these days. Uh, not only the organized discussion, but uh, all of the stray remarks uh, showing the mindset. Uh, well, we can't summarize uh, hundreds of pages that's riveting. And you must read it. I'm telling everybody, please, because it's so important to understand this. Now, let's uh, understand uh, basically uh, just in a couple of minutes, uh, what, what happened. And I think one of the great uh, insights of the many, many, many insights of this uh, book uh, is the role of Adlai Stevenson. Unbelievable. Uh, I don't think it's ever been told before, but it is completely riveting. Well, uh, one, one of the really interesting things uh, uh, that happens during the Cuban Missile Crisis in all kinds of different ways is the role that luck plays. Just 
you know, circumstance. Uh, it happens that on October 16th, uh, when Kennedy is informed early in the morning by McGeorge Bundy that the Soviet missiles have been uh, discovered, uh, Adlai Stevenson, who's the American ambassador to uh, the United Nations, uh, is in Washington uh, and he's arranged for a lunch with the president after he does his business at the State Department. After lunch, Kennedy takes him up to uh, the family quarters and shows him the photographs that uh, he saw that morning. And, <clears throat> and he met, the first meeting of the XCOM is over. Everybody has agreed we're going to have to bomb or invade Cuba. And by the way, Marty, on all on the mistaken impressions of every detail, whether the weapons are already installed, how many troops there are, every right. military assumption wrong, by, by the way. I think it's just worth underscoring. Yes, yes. Um, the, you know, they, uh, the CIA reports there are about uh, 10,000 Soviet troops there. There are actually 42,000. Uh, they do not know that the Soviets have tactical nuclear weapons. Uh, if we had invaded, it would have been a disaster that would have led to a worse disaster, well, you know, war. In any case, Stevenson looks at this um, stuff and uh, he's just as appalled as Kennedy was. And Kennedy says to him, uh, well, we're going to have to bomb or invade to get rid of, you know, those weapons. And Stevenson says, whoa, no, we don't. Uh, we can negotiate our way out of this. And we know what Stevenson said because the next day he wrote a memo summarizing their whole meeting. And uh, it is, uh, I think, pretty certain that Stevenson laid out the blueprint uh, in this memorandum for how to end the crisis without a war. Uh, and he got no credit for that whatsoever. Quite and, the contrary. Quite the contrary. Uh, <laughs> Kennedy tried, you know, at the end of uh, uh, the crisis, uh, Kennedy uh, has a, a friend of his who's a journalist, uh, Bartlett, uh, or, or encourages him to write an article about the Cuban Missile Crisis. And when he reads a draft of the article, he pencils into the margin, Stevenson wanted a Munich. And uh, he just stabs Stevenson in the back. Uh, so, you know, uh, Kennedy is a very complicated guy. This uh, is what I mean about uh, about the problem of remembering history from knowing history, because you show what really is what we remember is what we've been told, not 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 what really is. And it, it does uh, come through Kennedy's uh, rationality, uh, Stevenson's decency and diplomacy. And Utant, uh, the Secretary General of the UN, also playing a very constructive role. And Khrushchev, I would say the four of them together, uh, bring about this near miraculous solution against the advice of almost everybody else that would have ended the world, most likely. Uh, by trading the, the missiles, uh, by peaceful solution, uh, one question I have about this from a historical point of view that I can't understand at all. How was the trade of the Turkish missiles and the Cuban missiles kept? Why did the Soviets keep it secret? Why did Khrushchev keep it secret? To the point of losing his premiership, losing his power. And it was kept secret from the American people for a decade. So we thought, we had gone eyeball to eyeball, and it was tough diplomacy that did it. Where or I mean, tough toughness that did it. Where it was diplomacy, that's the real lesson. But we weren't even told that it's diplomacy, right? Uh, so I uh, just to try to you know sort of yeah. frame the story for our uh, listeners. Um, 
uh, near the end of the crisis, in effect, Khrushchev and Kennedy and Utant uh, formed essentially a team to try and solve, you know, this crisis, giving everybody a little of what they needed. Uh, Kennedy had made it clear that he was willing to make a pledge the United States would not invade Cuba. Okay, Khrushchev seemed to accept that. Then he came back with another demand uh, that he made public that uh, the Jupiter missiles in Turkey, 130 miles from the Soviet Union, uh, had to be removed in exchange for his removing the missiles from Cuba. Uh, the, all of Kennedy's advisors were absolutely against this. Uh, they felt Khrushchev was holding a gun to their head. Kennedy said to them, we are not going to have a very good war if people understand there's all we had to do is take these junk missiles out of, and they were junk, uh, you know, by 1962, junk missiles out of Turkey in exchange for Cuba. No, we can't do it. We can't do it. You know, the advisor said, you know, it'll uh, harm our credibility. And Kennedy was absolutely isolated from this. So he came up with the idea that he would send his brother to the Soviet ambassador in Washington, Dobrynin. And basically, Bobby told Dobrynin that those missiles would be out of there in three months, but they cannot in any way ever be associated with the idea that this was a trade. We'll deny it you know, so on and so forth. And we'll leave the missiles there too. Um, so why did Khrushchev keep that secret? Uh, this was a feather in his cap. Exactly. Uh, he kept the secret because he had look, he looked forward to a, uh, uh, to repairing the relationship with Kennedy that his lying to Kennedy about putting the missiles in Cuba had destroyed. And this was the, the foundation in effect of a new trusting relationship. Uh, and, that, and, make, that makes so much sense. And, and I, I had not made that link in my own mind. Yeah, and and then Kennedy's assassinated, and uh, but 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 before that, uh, I think it's uh, crucial to reflect on one of the I, I think the most powerful uh, conclusion after this peaceful diplomacy was the ability of Khrushchev and Kennedy the following year to come to the partial nuclear test ban treaty, uh, and I always regard that as uh, a a miracle of good sense and rationality uh, that after the almost destruction of the world, the, the two adversaries essentially made peace the following year. Yeah. Uh, and these two who had come to see themselves as partners were determined to get this right. And they did. And at least some argue that Kennedy's assassination was the payback of hardliners for that, although there's many other reasons why hardliners and right-wing nuts may have been engaged. But uh, they learned something from this of, of profound significance and redirected the world. Yes, I think the um, Cuban Missile Crisis was the fulcrum around which the Cold War turned. Uh, the first 17 years of the nuclear age uh, from Hiroshima to the Cuban Missile Crisis was the period of time where uh, the Curtis, let's call it the Curtis, Le, General Curtis LeMay uh, attitude uh, could, uh, could be uh, presented up front uh, as an uh, American potential policy. Afterwards, everybody, <clears throat> excuse me, learned 
you have to be much more careful. You know, you cannot, you know, threaten uh, nuclear war and expect to be able to sidestep it, uh, you know, with ease. Uh, the nuclear um, uh, deterrence structure that is set up is actually very dangerous. And at one point in the book, I point out that the real problem is that nuclear weapons are very good for initiating the kinds of crises they're designed to prevent. Mm -hmm. And they're no good for preventing or resolving the crisis once they have created it. Uh, so what the heck are these weapons for? I mean, what, you know, it's, it's no more um, uh, uh, sort of complicated in a sense, in a fundamental sense, then why are they there? For the same reasons mountains are there. They're there. You know, I mean, you know, right now, uh, those things are there. And how do you get rid of them? Uh, and that's the challenge of our future. How do we replace uh, the uh, imagined security that nuclear weapons provide nuclear weapons states uh, with a security that will uh, serve the same purpose without providing the horrendous danger of destroying civilization. You know, to go back to Hiroshima, on April 25th, 1945, Secretary of State, uh, uh, excuse me, Secretary of War Henry L. Stimson went to the new president, Truman, with a memorandum. And in that memorandum, he, it, he said, we are about to build a new weapon that can destroy civilization. Uh, he made it very clear, yeah. right? Even before nuclear weapons existed, these weapons can destroy civilization. And then he goes on to say in the memorandum that the United States, given its leadership in this, is morally responsible for any uh, destruction of civilization that may occur in the future. Uh, we have to live up to that moral responsibility. Marty, I uh, not only uh, am sure that all of us listening to you uh, agree with you, but I think that the first way to do this is to understand what you have shown uh, and to read your books and to uh, understand the profound lessons uh, of them. Uh, we have in front of us uh, in the world uh, the UN Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Uh, most of the world recognizes that this makes no sense, but the nuclear powers, including the United States, have not signed on. Uh, most of the world has signed on, but not the United States yet. And the lessons that you have that these weapons serve nothing but to keep us under that sword of Damocles that President Kennedy talked about. Now it's uh, 60 years uh, now since he said those words uh, remains absolutely true. We're profoundly indebted to you. Uh, your wisdom in Gambling with Armageddon, uh, our featured uh, book today, uh, the opening of the book club, your related books, uh, uh, all of them, path-breaking books uh, on uh, uh, Robert Oppenheimer on a world destroyed Hiroshima and its legacies teach the basic uh, essential survival value of cooperation. You point out the risks of ignorance. You point out the inability of two sides that want to make agreements to find that, but you also point out the life-saving uh, success when diplomacy is allowed its due. Marty, thank you so much uh, for educating humanity. Thank you so much for joining today. Uh, let me uh, thank everybody that has uh, joined on today. 
uh, with the book club that uh, I'm thrilled that we're going to be having this adventure with the great, great writers and historians uh, uh, as uh, Marty Sherwin today. Our next uh, book club is on February 24th. Uh, we're going to be speaking with Richard Rothstein, uh, who is the author of The Color of Law, a piercing and scintillating account of the uh, racism built into American policy for so long. Obviously, another legacy that we are grappling with today. It's also a fantastic book, and I look forward to being together with you on February 24th. Once again, on behalf of all of us, uh, Marty, congratulations on this uh, wonderful uh, world important accomplishment. And thank you so much for being with thank us you. today. Thank you, Jeffrey. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.